Robert McNeil, born in 1931, was born in Montreal, Canada. He is a radio and television journalist. He has worked for NBC Radio and for the British Broadcasting Corporation, the BBC. In the mid-1970s, McNeil came to public television station WNET to host his own news analysis program, which has grown into the highly regarded McNeil Lair News Hour. This differs from other news programs by offering more in-depth reports on important issues. In the following essay, McNeil criticizes American television programming. This is The Trouble with Television by Robert McNeil. It is difficult to escape the influence of television. If you fit the statistical averages by the age of 20, you will have been exposed to at least 20 thousand hours of television. You can add 10,000 hours for each decade you have lived after the age of 20. The only things Americans do more than watch television are work and sleep. Calculate for a moment what could be done with even a part of those hours. 5,000 hours, I am told, are what a typical college undergraduate spends working on a bachelor's degree. In 10,000 hours, you could have earned and learned enough to become an astronomer or engineer. You could have learned several languages fluently. If it appealed to you, you could be reading Homer in the original Greek or Dostoevsky in Russian. If it didn't, you could have walked around the world and written a book about it. The trouble with television is that it discourages concentration. Almost anything interesting and rewarding in life requires some constructive, consistently applied effort. The dullest, the least gifted of us can achieve things that seem miraculous to those who never concentrate on anything. But television encourages us to apply no effort. It sells us instant gratification. It diverts us only to divert, to make the time pass without pain. Television's variety becomes a narcotic, not a stimulus. Its serial kaleidoscope exposures force us to follow its lead. The viewer is on a perpetual guided tour. 30 minutes at the museum, 30 minutes at the cathedral, then back on the bus to the next attraction. Except on television, typically the spans allotted are on the order of minutes or seconds. And the chosen delights are more often car crashes and people killing one another. In short, a lot of television usurps one of the most precious of all human gifts, the ability to focus your attention yourself rather than just passively surrender it. Capturing your attention and holding it is the prime motive of most television programming and enhances its role as a profitable advertising vehicle. Programmers live in constant fear of losing anyone's attention. Anyone's. The surest way to avoid doing so is to keep everything brief, not to strain the attention of anyone, but instead to provide constant stimulation through variety, novelty, action, and movement. Quite simply, Television operates on the appeal to the short attention span. It is simply the easiest way out, but it has come to be regarded as a given and inherent in the medium itself that as an imperative, as though General Sadoff or one of the other august pioneers of video had bequeathed to us tablets of stone 
commanding that nothing in television shall ever require more than a few moments concentration. In its place, that is fine. Who can quarrel with a medium that so brilliantly packages escapist entertainment as a mass marketing tool? But I see its values now pervading this nation and its life. It has become fashionable to think that, like fast food, fast ideas are the way to get to a fast-moving, impatient public. In the case of news, this practice, in my view, results in inefficient communication. I question how much of television's nightly news effort is really absorbable and understandable. Much of it is what has been aptly described as machine gunning with scraps. I think its technique fights coherence. I think it tends to make things ultimately boring and dismissible unless they are accompanied by horrifying pictures because almost anything is boring and dismissible if you know nothing about it. I believe that TV's appeal to the short attention span is not only inefficient communication, but decivilizing as well. Consider the casual assumptions that television tends to cultivate, that complexity must be avoided, that visual stimulation is a substitute for thought, that verbal precision is an anachronism. It may be old fashioned, but I was taught that thought is words, arranged in grammatically precise ways. There is a crisis of illiteracy in this country. One study estimates that some 30 million adult Americans are functionally illiterate. It cannot read or write well enough to answer a want ad or understand the instructions on a medicine bottle. Literacy may not be an inalienable human right, but it is one that the highly literate founding fathers might not have found unreasonable or even unattainable. We are not only not attaining it as a nation, statistically speaking, but we are falling further and further short of attaining it. And while I would not be so simplistic as to suggest that television is the cause, I believe that it contributes and is an influence. Everything about this nation, the structure of the society, its forms of family organization, its economy, its place in the world, has become more complex, not less. Yet, its dominating communications instrument, its principal form of national linkage, is one that sells neat resolutions to human problems that usually have no neat resolutions. It is all symbolized in my mind by the hugely successful art form that television has made central to the culture, the 30-second commercial. The tiny drama of the earnest housewife who finds happiness in choosing the right toothpaste. When before in human history has so much humanity collectively surrendered so much of its leisure to one toy, one mass diversion? When before has virtually an entire nation surrendered itself wholesale to a medium for selling? Some years ago, Yale University law professor Charles L. Black Jr. wrote, forced feeding on trivial fare is not itself a trivial matter. I think this society is being force fed with trivial fare, and I fear the effects on our habits of mind, our language, our tolerance for effort, and our appetite for complexity are only dimly perceived. If I am wrong, we will have done no harm to look at the issue skeptically and critically to consider how we should be resisting it. I hope you will join me in doing so.
That is The Trouble with Television by Robert.